Good morning, Manitou. Glad that you are able to join us. We are here on the second Sunday of Lent when Jesus gets confronted, even rebuked by his, uh, his friend and disciple, Peter. Listen, to find out how Jesus responds. So we're glad we hear, you're here with us this Sunday. And may it be a, a gathering, some time that both encourages you and challenges you as we walk in this season of Lent. She, there we go. Oh. <laughs> you oh, you can, there's another one in the, in the office. You've been talking to use it. So. It'll be on the screen. Yeah. Um, here we are back at our online Zoom service. Last week we did a hybrid in-person online, which I think went okay. I think it went better than I expected actually and still looking for feedback if you have feedback on that. And this week we're back online. The next week we'll be back in person and Zoom, like the hybrid, just like we did last week. So, um, so look forward to giving that a shot again. Um, yeah, well, let's, let's jump in. Let me open with a word of prayer, then we'll have our reminder, then we'll do some, uh, some singing. singing. Let us pray. Lord, thanks for the day you've given us. Thanks for waking us up. Thanks for giving us this way to connect with one another. Thanks for giving us the breath, the air we're breathing in right now. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us increasingly to take less for granted, and to appreciate more. We ask that you receive this offering of our presence and of our words and of our thoughts, and that in so showing up, we might receive from you what you have to offer us this morning. Pray this in your name, O oh Lord. Amen. 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 I invite us to begin as we do each uh, each week with a reminder of who we are and whose we are. I invite you to say with me, I am a child of God, holy and beloved. Benjamin. 
I'm sorry, I am very yawning. Jamie Jamie's 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 confession. Uh, as a lead into the confession, we'll say together, I invite you to hear these words of a reminder of our belovedness. We give thee back the life we own, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. With that in mind, I invite you to read this through this confession, and then I'll start to pray it, and as you feel so led, join with me in offering it for yourselves. Next slide, Benjamin. Actually, I'll say the non-bold part and you reply with the bold. <laughs> empty. We come, we come to, come to you empty. empty. Open. We come, we come to you open. open. Vulnerable. We come, we come to you with vulnerable. It says with vulnerable. <laughs> We give thee back this life we thought we owned, that in your infinite love, so richer and fuller in a baby. We offer all of ourselves, Lord, all we're able to, um, as much as we can this morning, and we trust it to your love. Have mercy on us, have grace on us, have patience with us, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hear the good news, brothers and sisters. God receives us as we are and loves us too much to leave us there. God takes away the wounds, takes away the woundedness and the wounding. God welcomes us into his beloved arms, offering grace and mercy and forgiveness. And so I remind you this morning that you are forgiven. You are forgiven. You are forgiven.
Kindness by Naomi Shihab Nye. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go, all this must go, so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness, how you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and that's in the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow, sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere like a shadow or a friend. Today's reading is from the book of Mark, chapters 8, verses 31 to 38. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel, gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Word of God. Thanks be to God. Welcome to the second Sunday in Lent, here where we join Jesus with his disciples in a little altercation. Before we step into this passage, I want to start with a little, little game, a little, now nah, not so much a game, just a little quiz. I'm going to do some sign language. No, it's not it's hand signals, hand signals, and you tell me what the hand signals mean, okay? You just speak it out loud if, you know, just unmute and yell it. We don't have to call on you. Okay, here we go. Peace. Peace, Peace. yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> two. Um, all right. Uh, bye. Bye. Bye or bye. Yeah. Good job. It's all good. Yellow. <laughs> Loser. Loser. Okay. 
So yeah, so those are those are some hand signals that have been around for some for not too long, some for a really long time. Of course, you got the peace symbol, which uh, showed up in the, like the 1950s as a as a, uh, a symbol for nuclear disarmament. It it actually meant victory before that. Um, it still can mean both. Also, the number two, um, and then you've got the wave, which we think uh, comes from a salute, maybe in some way. Uh, and then we have thumbs up, which um, shows up specifically as meaning all good after World War I. It's somehow tied to Americans coming over and flying uh, flights and the British people saying that this was what thumbs up. But it's also connected with somehow with gladiatorial fights, uh, although thumbs up actually meant to die and thumbs down to live, uh, possibly. Um, and then we have the shaka which is of Polynesian culture. It may have been around for a long time, but became popular with the, uh, the surfer crowd when it uh, became more popular in the 60s. And then of course, we have the one that's been around the least amount of time. It is, uh, can anyone guess where the L on the forehead came to be? Jane's guessing All Star, the Smash Mouth song. She was looking pretty dumb with her finger and her thumb in the shape of an L on her forehead. Uh, it's actually a little debated because the other place that it shows up is in the uh, none other than the movie Ace Ventura, Pet Detective with Jim Carrey, which I do not recommend that you watch with your eight and your 10 year old uh, kids. Not a good idea, not that I would ever do that. <laughs> or with anybody. <laughs> um, and in there, you've got Jim Carrey, whose character continually calls people a loser, and then the shape of the L on the forehead. So you may be thinking, wow, Ken, this is great. I didn't know we were going to get a little lesson in hand sign language this morning, um, but uh, this is wonderful. Not sure what in the world it has to do with the passage this morning, and that's a fair question. Because the L has until, um, but if you hang around long enough, I believe that uh, it gets better. Because the L to this point has been a term of derision, a mock, and a ridicule. But here today, I'm going to make the case that instead it should be a symbol for life. Is that possible? Or will I look like a loser? Let's venture forth, find out. So our passage today, it begins with Jesus doing some teaching. Now, until this point, Jesus has been doing mostly miracles in the Gospel of Mark, and now he turns to doing some teaching. And uh, I imagine with the impressiveness of the miracles that uh, the disciples were quite shocked to find out what Jesus was teaching. They seemed probably incongruous after they heard what he had to say. The son of man is how he starts. And this is a term that Jesus uses for himself. It means the human one, the one who's very human. In fact, the most human. This one is going to suffer. Huh. I don't like that. And then he's going to be rejected. Oh, rejection is rarely a good thing. I really don't like that. And then be killed. What kind of teaching is this? I imagine that by this point, the disciples had gotten so riled up and confused that they probably didn't even hear the fourth thing that Jesus said in his teaching. It should come as no surprise that the ever impulsive, boisterous, vocal Peter was the one to step forward first. And he calls Jesus out, calls Jesus out on this teaching. Now, what we don't know, what we didn't read, is that before this teaching, Jesus had asked the disciples, he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, ever ready to step forward first, says, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says, thumbs up, you got it, buddy. And with that, everyone was peaceful. They liked that. Jesus, uh, had Peter got it right. Now, now Peter's like, I got this right, and here Jesus is saying this crazy stuff. And so Peter's like, whoa, 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 this, what you're talking about, the Son of Man, that's not the Messiah. 
That's not what I think of when we think you say the Messiah. Now, to this point, Peter had grown up hearing versions of the Messiah that were of a more like a king or a warrior or a powerful prophet who could do miraculous things, sort of like the high school quarterback or the successful CEO, the person who wins the Academy Awards. This person was supposed to be all of that wrapped into one. And here, Jesus shows up saying something different. The Messiah is supposed to be a winner. And this person sounds a bit like a loser. We love winners, don't we? Winning isn't everything. It's the only thing. It's a coach. One of the, Some coach said that. Winners make it into the Hall of Fame. Losers make it into the Hall of Shame. Amazon, if you just look up uh, books that start with winning at, you get stuff like winning at poker, winning at chess, winning at retirement. You know you could win at retirement. Winning at all costs. Russell Wilson, our, our, our Super Bowl winning quarterback, he and his wife had a, uh, had a son. You know what they named him? Win. Yeah. So winning is what we want. We want this in life. And so Peter also, I mean, he had, had that sense as all. Well. Everyone wants to win. And so when Jesus says that he's going to be rejected and killed, Peter's like, no, 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 no. Rejected, killed, this can't be true. This won't be for you. You're a winner, Jesus, not a loser. I won't let this happen. And so what is Jesus' response? And what seems like one of his more insensitive and mean moments, he turns on Peter and rebukes him, compares him to Satan, and says, get behind me. Now, I don't know if he played cards, uh, but um, a couple of the games I like to play are hearts and spades. Anyone hearts, spades, play those? Got a hand over here. I see that hand. Yes. Okay. So in hearts and spades, they're great games, and I love playing both of them. The problem is sometimes I, I start to play one and I forget that I'm playing the other. And, uh, and so sometimes when we're, we're playing uh, spades, I'll, uh, or no, we're playing hearts, I will uh, lay down my hand. I'm like, yes, I got 22 points. And it's only then that I realize in hearts, you don't want to get points, whereas spades, you do want to get points. And I get it wrong. One of the things I think is going on here is Peter's playing spades. He's trying to get the points. And Jesus says, no, 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 we're not playing that game. We're playing hearts where you want to lose the points. You don't want to get them. And so you're playing the wrong game, and Jesus is trying to say, let's, let's play the right game. I want to get you in it. It's, it's going to take some pain to get over here and learn this new game, but I promise you, in the long run, it's so much better. In fact, it's what leads to life. And so Jesus begins to explain, what does it mean to play hearts? If you want to become my followers, if anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This is how Jesus begins that teaching. If you want to become your followers, pick up your cross. You have to remember that before this time, the cross, it wasn't a decoration. It wasn't jewelry. It wasn't something that you would even put on top of your steeple. The cross was a, a means of public execution. It was Rome's way of saying to everyone else, we're winners. And the folks who have to endure this, they're the, the biggest losers of all. And Jesus is saying to pick up this symbol, carry it. And then he continues, as a way I think of explaining this, for those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Here's where I begin to think Jesus is getting at the heart of the teaching. He puts his finger and his thumb in the shape of an L on his forehead. And he says, if you want to win, lose. If you want to win, you have to lose. Is this not the dumbest thing you've ever heard? No, no. To win, you have to work hard. And you have to get lucky from time to time. 
To win, you need to have more points than the other person. You need to have more runs than the other person or more money than the other people or more bombs or more votes, not less. We all move everything to trying to win. That's how you win. Oh, wait a second. Jesus is saying we're playing hearts, we're not playing spades. To win, lose. To find, you lose. To gain, you got to lose something. How can this be? It actually makes sense if it gets really simple. And uh, I meant to bring an egg in. I forgot to bring an egg. Also, I was probably a little worried subconsciously that I dropped the egg in, in here in the sanctuary. So imagine that I have an egg right here. It's beautiful. You think about eggs. They're amazing that they all have similar shapes. They're, they're so similar. You just the carton, they all fit in there. And they're just this, this beautiful, either brown color or white color. Let's imagine this is a brown egg. It's beautiful. Wouldn't you like to just keep this thing forever? Yes, until you find out what a fried egg tastes like. I can remember getting up at my grandparents' house and I would go down to breakfast and my grandfather would be there. He always was up earlier. And, uh, and he would ask me if I wanted him to fix me breakfast. And I said, of course. And he always fixed eggs and some bacon. He said, well, how do you want your egg? And the first time he said it, I, I said, I don't know, cooked. And he said, well, there's different ways. You could have it scrambled or, or fried sunny side up. Sunny side up, that sounds fun. So I had him fix me a sunny side up egg puts it on my plate. It looks like a sun. He gave me some toast. He said, you want to break it open, dip the toast in there. That'll be really good. I did that. And I mean, it was like the sun was rising. Delicious. Now, to get to the fried egg, what do you have to do? You got to lose the shell. You got to break it open to get there. To gain this other thing, you have to lose something else. You know, the old saying, in order to make an omelet, you got to break some eggs. This is what's going on. To gain something greater, sometimes we have to lose something lesser. Okay, you might be saying that. Well, that's and you didn't really lose something. You just kind of changed it from one thing into the other. Okay, how about this? When I was in uh, elementary school, I had a dream to be a professional baseball player. And when I hit three home runs my 12 year old season, I thought I'm on the way. And when I made my baseball team in high school as a sophomore and became the second string catcher, I said, yes, this is happening. My junior year, when I became the third string catcher, I began to have some doubts. And by the time of my senior year, when I was the fourth string catcher, only warming up pitchers, I thought maybe this isn't going to happen. And so I gave up on that dream and I followed a different path. I lost it. In a sense of being a professional baseball player, I was a loser. Looking back on that now, I'm really thankful that that wasn't the path I went down. I mean, because in all likelihood, if I'd have been just good enough to go and play baseball at some, at, at some other school, I wouldn't have gone to the school I went to. And my path would have been totally different. In order to gain this life, I had to let go of that one. Okay, so my, I want to give some space to invite you to consider, is there something you've lost to gain? Is there something in your life you've needed to lose, be it either you gave it up willingly or was kind of forced on you in order to gain something else? So think about, think about that question. Now, while you're thinking about it, I'm going to tell you one more, give you one more example. When Aaron and I were in... Um, Atlanta, we went to this Sunday school class at uh, North Avenue Presbyterian Church, and there was a couple who came to the class uh, who I'll never forget because they brought their dog with them, and the reason they brought the dog with them was because that he was blind, and I don't remember the couple's name, but I do remember the dog's name was Trinket, and he was like, it's the name they, the dog had when we got the dog. Dog's name was Trinket, and, and uh, I do remember one day, um, he shared his story about how he became blind. He wasn't born blind. He actually became blind as, uh, as an adult in his late twenties uh, when he contracted chickenpox. And I didn't know at that point that chickenpox, when you get it as an adult, can be uh, have some serious side effects. One of them is blindness, and so he became blind. I think he could sense our sadness at, at, at what we saw as a tragedy. And he said, 
hey, don't feel sorry for me. He said, at that point, I was doing everything I could to lose my life. I was eating too much. I was drinking too much. I was sleeping around too much. And my life was meant really nothing. When I became blind, everything started to change. He said, I wouldn't have the peace that I have now without losing my sight. I would not be with my wife now had I not lost my sight. Losing my sight helped me see more clearly than I had in my whole life. Sometimes losing is winning, is gaining, is is finding. So let me pause there. In your own life, have there been ways that you have found by losing or gained by losing or won by losing. Yeah, um, I'll go. Um, I, like my entire life, wanted to be a nurse and um, it just didn't work out. Um, and But my, like the career path I'm on now and um, working where I am, I get to work like with our clinicians and um, on the business side and lots do lots of fun things too. So um well, I was really sad not to, um, like get to be a nurse and do what I'd always thought I would do. Um, I'm very happy with where I am now. And it, I think it worked out better than I could have ever thought. Thanks, Tracy. Sherry. Okay. This one kind of is you and me, you lost something. You lost a teacher at our camp, but if you had not lost that teacher, you wouldn't have asked me to be involved. And that's how I got introduced to the church was through our camp. So I'm really thankful that that person bailed on you at the last second. <laughs> that worked out great. <laughs> that's awesome. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, I, I have one, I, I guess I can go. Um, so I thought I was gonna go to Gray for middle school and I showed up there and it turns out I lost my spot um, like on their roster and I was on the wait list. So I went to Wainwright and I ended up actually going there and I wouldn't have had all the friends that I have now if I didn't go to Wainwright. So I guess that counts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Kylie. Jane. You might want to keep them more closer. Um, uh, during coronavirus, I lost a lot of, um, well, I didn't lose my friends, but I lost like the time that I got to spend with them because, you know, we had to quarantine. And I gained a lot of time spending with my family, which is actually a blessing because even though it can get frustrating sometimes, I'm not going to be here next year. So it's kind of nice to be able to spend a lot of extra time with them during the last like year that I'm at home. So thanks, Jane. Thank you all for, for sharing and for thinking about that. I invite you to continue to let that thought in the back of your mind. And if you think of something you didn't want to share it out loud, and if you want to email it to me, I'd love to hear it. Um, it's one thing I think we think of in retrospect, but it also is a question for us as we move forward. Is there something that, um, that I'm being invited to lose 
so that I might accept something bigger. I think the hard, one of the hard things about losing is it is often tied to shame, which makes Jesus's words here at the end seem so challenging and so shocking. It's actually the thing about this passage I'm the most shocked by is when Jesus says, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. It sounds like he's just a really bad parent. Um, and, and, and three years ago, I preached a sermon and talked directly about that. If you're interested in how I answer that, let me know. I'll be happy to share that sermon with you. But for now, I'm just going to get to the shortcut on it and, and, and go to the point in saying that uh, uh, Jesus, I don't think, was ever shame, did ever shamed others, nor did he ever feel shame. I mean, if you look at how he went about, you had the woman caught in adultery, he protects her. The woman who pours perfume on his feet, he defends her. Zacchaeus, who everybody hates, he asks him to come down so that he can eat in his house. The Roman centurion who nails him, nails him to the tree cross, he forgives him. And Peter, who denies knowing Jesus, who does exactly what Jesus says, instead of Jesus shaming him, he calls him back in and says, do you love me? And invites him back into ministry. The disciples who all fled, who hide in an upper room, Jesus comes in and he says, peace be with you. He doesn't shame them. Does Jesus hold people accountable? Yes. But does he shame them? No, I think there's a difference. In fact, it is this inability to shame others that I think is one of Jesus' greatest powers. Because what, if anything, can you imagine being more shameful than having your friends deny you? Having crowds of your neighbors mock you and say, we want you to die having the police arrest you and beat you and spit on you, and then being stripped of all of your clothes and being hoisted up for everyone else to see and laugh at and ridicule. Can you, I, I mean, it's beyond my ability to come close to even imagining that and how embarrassing that would be. Talk about losing. And yet, here we are. If you can imagine our sanctuary, we're gathered around the table, which sitting on that table is the symbol of losers. It is a symbol that has been transformed from one of losing and of losers to one of finding and of gaining. The L with a finger and thumb on the shape of his forehead doesn't mean loser, it means life. So I'll close with this quote it's by, from a, a guy named Richard Rohr, um, who in some ways is, is riffing off of Thomas Merton, who says that there are a true self and a false self. And this is, this is what he says. He says, your false self is who you think you are. Your thinking does not make it true. Your false self is almost entirely a social construct to get you started on your life. It is a set of agreements between your childhood and your parents, your family, your neighbors, your school chums, your partner, spouse, and your religion. It's your container for your separate self. Jesus would call it your wineskin, which he points out usually cannot hold any new wine. Your ego, ego container likes to stay contained. It hates change. Your false self is how you define yourself outside of love, relationship, or divine union. After you, you have spent many years laboriously building this separate self with all its labels and preoccupations, you are very attached to it. And why wouldn't you be? It's what you know and all you know. To move beyond it will always feel like losing or dying. Perhaps you've noticed that the master teachers like Jesus and the Buddha, St. Francis, all the Teresas of Villa, Lasu and Calcutta, Hafiz, Kabir, and Rumi talk about dying much more than we are comfortable with. They all know that if you do not learn the art of dying and letting go early, you will hold on to your false self far too long until it kills you anyway. May we, brothers and sisters, learn the ancient and essential art of losing. Let us pray. O oh God, who came to teach us, we were playing 
a different game. Teach us to play the game by your rules. For within it, it, there is so much more life, but it is so hard to figure out sometimes. It's so hard to trust you. We won't get it all in one sitting. So help us in these moments to perhaps to get a little inkling, a little glimmer of who you are calling us to be, of who we are that's hidden in you, Christ, this, this self which you have and you know and you long for us to live into it, Lord. Give us a glimpse of that, that a hunger in our hearts might grow and develop, that we want to be more like that self, whatever the cost may be. We pray this, O Lord, as your servant St. Francis prayed, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. A divine master grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Amen. I invite us now into a time of sharing prayers and praises. Um, start with announcements. A reminder that next week we'll be doing the hybrid in person online. If you can do Zoom online, we encourage you to do so. If not, you're welcome to come and join us in person. All the caveats continue to apply. Masks, social distancing, don't come if you're sick. And we will also, on next Sunday, be doing a, um, a congregational meeting. And so you should have gotten a newsletter. And, um, and so bring that with you, have that available. So it'll be helpful in that congregational meeting. Anyone else have any announcements? And Benjamin, you can unpin me now, or maybe I can do it. Oh, there we go. Seeing no other announcements, anyone have prayers or praises? Sherry. I have prayers from Karen for Robbie's mom and dad just found out that their lease is going to expire sooner than they thought. So they're they need prayers because they're scrambling to find new new home. And a praise from Karen that she finally got her uh, appointment to get a scan. And so that is my prayers and praises for Karen. Well, so prayers for uh, for housing for Robbie and his family, and a praise for Karen's. Um, um, getting her the results from her scan or the, the date for the appointment for it. This is our prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. And then I have prayers from Janice. She's asking prayers for her 16-year-old grandson has a pretty bad case of COVID and pneumonia. He's back home, but he's still not able to breathe. So prayers for that. And also for her husband's sister, Donna, who's having experimental brain surgery for tremors. So for these prayers from Janice, these are our prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Keep going. I have a big praise. I Let's got, hear it. I got my lab results back finally. And from what I recall, it's all good. And I got the drain tube taken out Thursday. Stop. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> you forgot That's that awesome. one. <laughs> I did. Yeah, there's lots more. There's a number of more. Yeah, another hand signals I left off. <laughs> this is for Sherry's uh, health and healing. This is our praise to the Lord. Lord, hear our praise. Yay. Woohoo. Woo um, Cody, I saw Parker's recent update. I don't know if you want to share 
um, from your perspective, how Parker's doing? No? Okay. Uh, so Parker, uh, he's out of the, from what I read the last update, he's out of, he's at home, even set up a Valentine's display and whatnot, and um, is done with his last bits of chemo. And so now it's on to the next stage, which I think will be a little space before anything else happens. Um, but he'll always be needing to check um, and see where things are. So ongoing prayers for Parker Ayers and his family. This is our prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Sherry. I have another praise. He only had his one year scan after his finishing chemo and he, he is cancer free after one year. All right, that's a big deal. So, so praise for Keone being cancer free after a year. This is our praise to the Lord. Lord, hear our praise. Yay. I got a um, text from my dad. Um, he, it, there's a, there's a, a, a um, young man he started mentoring when he was like 11 years old and is for the last 10 years. And, and it's uh, just a rough, rough, rough family situation. Um, and uh, his uh, Jeffries is, is uh, the, the young man's name, who's he's now 22 or 23 years old. Oh, so he's 18. And uh, he um, we just found out that his mother, uh, they found his mother passed away. Um, and, um, and, and so, um, yeah, just prayers for Jeffrey and the family and for my parents as they're present in their lives in this time, um, for a family that, uh, has not gotten a lot of breaks and has gone through a lot. So this is our prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Jeremy. I saw you wave. I don't know if that was. Yeah. It. Um, just, I want to ask for prayers for Cody. I think that your sermon today is, um, pretty, um, reflective of kind of what she's going through and with her career and just having to let go to, um, to move on. And so just prayers for her. as She goes through all those struggles of letting go. Yeah. So prayers for Cody and her, uh, letting go of one career and moving into another one. This is our prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Anybody else? Jane? Um, middle schoolers go back to school this week. Um, I think it's sixth grade. Or, yeah, it's sixth graders because some high schoolers are going back in a couple weeks and elementary schoolers are mostly back. So, just prayers that that continues to go well and that people are safe and that nobody gets overdosed by. So. Yeah, so prayers for the sixth graders going back today, uh, tomorrow, this week, and um, and for for those uh, the teachers and for the students who are who are getting back into school and not able to go back yet. Um, prayers on both sides of it. So this is our prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We're going back on Thursday. All right, I invite us to gather these prayers and praises. We'll um, offer them and then close with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Lord, as we do each week, we ask that you would give us faith. Give us the faith to believe that you are here with us. And that in being here, you have heard our prayers, heard our praises. You even know what we didn't say that was on our heart and our mind. Give us the faith to believe and trust us. And Lord, now we pray as Jesus, the word made flesh, showed up to help give us this faith. We pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. Amen. Sisters, may you go from here and whether you are invited to lose something or it's just taken from you, may you go from here and let that L stand for not for loser, but for life, that giving up you'll find, may you gain, and may you find and see it as a way to win. Go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit till we meet again, all God's children said. Amen. You're welcome to hang around as long as you want. There's coffee on the stove. There's <laughs> cereal in the cupboard. Help yourself to whatever's in the fridge. Make yourself at home as long as you want. <laughs>